Welcome to our Monday afternoon press conferences. And um, we're starting with lessons from the Chelyabinsk airburst. Our speakers in this order will be Clark R. Chapman from the Department of Space Studies at Southwest Research Institute in Boulder. Alexander Smirnov of Kaz NDC Institute of Geophysical Research is in Altami, Kazakhstan. Mark Boslo with Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And David A. Kring, USRA Lunar and Planetary Institute at Houston, Texas. Okay, good afternoon. I'm Clark Chapman, and I'm uh, going, a convener of tomorrow morning's session on Chelyabinsk and the afternoon poster session. And I'd like to briefly introduce the topic and talk about its uh, connection with natural hazards. Uh, on February 15th, there was this amazing event in the skies over the city of about a million people, a uh, Russian city, Chelyabinsk, in which uh, there was a flash of light, many times brighter than the sun, followed by a shock wave that uh, was actually the first ever asteroid impact disaster in the history, uh, in human history. Um, more than 1,600 people checked in at hospitals as a result. Uh, 7,000 buildings uh, suffered at least minor damage, typically broken windows. Nobody was killed, but nonetheless, uh, the early estimates of the total damage of several tens of millions of dollars ranks it with a typical United States presidentially declared major disaster. Now, it certainly is a minor disaster compared with the, the very big ones, uh, Fukushima and, and so on, but it uh, was a real disaster. Uh, there was a, a state of emergency declared for a couple of weeks in Chelyabinsk. Um, why, why, why did this disaster happen? And there are several reasons and lessons for the future. Uh, one is it was really unlucky, given that asteroids strike anywhere on the Earth and the majority would strike in the ocean, it actually struck on the outskirts of a city with a population of over a million. So therefore, compared to striking at a random kind of rural location, uh, not very heavily populated, there were a lot more people were affected. But um, for historical context, NASA had a study uh, 10 years ago, uh, a rather exhaustive study of the asteroid impact hazard, and concluded that any incoming asteroid smaller than about 40 meters, 45 meters in diameter, would uh, explode harmlessly in the far upper atmosphere and would not be uh, dangerous. So here we have something that's 20 meters in size, that's you know more than um, 10 times less massive, and yet it caused a lot of damage, and it's pretty lucky that nobody was killed. Uh, and so what's go going on here? Well, um, for one thing, uh, it, Chelyabinsk came in at a very shallow angle, and as uh, Mark may uh, briefly mention in a moment, um, had it come in at a more typical steeper angle, 45 degrees or something, it would have uh, exploded or the explo uh, airburst would have carried to lower elevations and people right under it uh, could well have suffered much more of a shock wave and damage than happened in Chelyabinsk. So um, I think we now have to change our tune and realize that if we get a warning that a near-Earth asteroid is about to hit sometime in the next few days or next years, um, if it's 20 meters in diameter, an emergency management official really ought to take it seriously. In fact, we don't know how big these things are, typically. Uh, it takes detailed astronomical observations to determine the exact size, so if you think it's 20 meters, it might actually be 30 meters. Um, anyway, there's also the issue uh, and question of whether these things are happening more frequently than, um, than we thought. And, and here's a, a situation where I think it's, uh, it's still a question. I, I'm inclined to think that they probably are happening more often than we thought. Um, there's a fellow who's an expert on the frequency of small, Earth, uh, small near Earth asteroids called Alan Harris, who 
sort of every year publishes a de definitive description of the number of asteroids of different sizes that uh, exist and hence the chances that they'll hit the Earth. And uh, it's pretty likely, I think, that there are several times as many of these actually hitting. Tunguska that hit uh, a century ago is supposed to be a once every 2,000 year event according to Harris. And, Chelyabinsk is supposed to be a once every 200 year event and it just happened. And there's some other evidence that suggests that things might be hitting more frequently than we thought, although there's also some contrary evidence. Uh, interpretations of two astronomical satellite observations of near Earth asteroids, NEOWISE and, uh, and uh, an another infrared telescope. Um, suggests there might be fewer asteroids of these sizes. This is a size range that is very Im imperfectly known. Um, for telescopic surveys, we see the big ones and know their numbers quite well. Um, the tiny ones, uh, like Chelyabinsk, are very rarely seen and they have to be especially close to the Earth to be seen. Um, it's kind of like if you're surveying cats in your house, they'd be easy to find, but you're surveying fruit flies in your house, you probably don't know their, their numbers very well. Um, but on, from the other side, meteors are well observed. Um, there are many of them, and, uh, and they've been well studied, but things as big and bright as Chelyabinsk are extremely rare. So it's an unknown size range, and yet it's the most dangerous in the sense that uh, emergency managers are going to hear about a Chelyabinsk uh, many, many more times than they're going to hear about an even larger, rarer, more damaging impact. So in our lifetimes, uh, there will probably be more of these Chelyabinsks, and uh, so we ought to get used to it. I think I'll stop at that point and turn it over to uh, Dr. Smirnoff. <laughs> Who's going to show slides. I do have some handouts uh, afterwards if you're interested. So, Chelebinsk event, it was um, uh, actually it's a unique event, and people will study uh, this stuff for, for years and years. And uh, I, I, I don't have too much to say, actually. I just want to mention two uh, technology which are very important when you are trying to, to, to get some information about uh, the bolides. It, it is the, these technologies are seismology and uh, infrasound. And uh, what I want to, to, to say is that uh, uh, everybody knows that this uh, bolide fall in, uh, in Russia. But um, paradoxically, it was uh, well, very well recorded in Kazakhstan, not in Russia, which is a, a neighboring country. And uh, I, I don't so think it's very good for me to s say this way, but we did it better than Russian do. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, our Kazakhstani array, uh, IS-31, uh, here in Kazakhstan, it was most close to epicenter. And we also have another one uh, here in Kurchatov, which is uh, also not that far from the, from the epicenter. Uh, and uh, we have all four uh, e e elements in uh, operation mode at the moment. So, and uh, this station is not uh, well, very well uh, known to, to, to scientific society. It's, it's pretty new, it's maybe two years old, and uh, I, I, I want to attract attention of everybody who is interested in this, to, to use this data to study Chelyabinsk event. And the uh, second uh, uh, technology is seismology, and uh, we also have very uh, good um, uh, seismic station in Kazakhstan, which uh, well recorded this event. Uh, all the stations on this slide are not just three component stations, it's uh, s seismic groups. So it's a uh, nine element array, all of them. Uh, it's, it's very uh, good stuff to, to study seismic signals and uh, 
Uh, you see the distances, we, we, we were very close to epicenter, we recorded it very well. If you uh, want to get more details about seismic and infrasound signals from Bob I invite everybody to visit the tomorrow uh, session uh, and uh, to, to see talk of Dr. Garcia's and mine and others to, 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 to get more details. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Boslow. Thank you. Now I have to figure out how to find my presentation here. Okay, good, here we go. So I, I wanna make three, kind of three points. Um, first, um, so we got really, in, in the terms of science, we got very lucky with Chelyabinsk because, and the same thing that made the people of Chelyabinsk unlucky made us as scientists lucky because we got to collect a lot of data because it was near a city. Um, so there was all this serendipitous uh, videography and photography. Um, and as Clark pointed out, um, we may expect to see something, maybe not this big, but big events like this again in our lifetimes. Um, and how can we do better science, possibly? And, and one concept uh, for a new way to do that is uh, to have an array of telescopes to discover these things before they hit the planet. Small ones with a fast enough uh, return rate that enough of the sky is covered that we might actually see one of these coming. If we had seen the Chelyabinsk object coming beforehand, we wouldn't have to rely on these, you know, these are spectacular videos, but from a research perspective, they weren't research quality. They weren't high, uh, high, super high resolution. They weren't super high speed. Uh, if you knew in advance, you could put out an array. Um, that's my first point. The, the second thing I want to talk about is I'm going to show some new uh, 3D renderings of simulations that we hadn't done in time for the publications that came out last month. And, and in seeing them, you can really kind of get an intuitive feel for the flow in the wake, in the wake that this object left behind. And the, th the third thing I want to do is just show some beautiful uh, photomicrographs um, that my colleagues at University of uh, New Mexico have, have taken um, from the meteorites. So, uh, so this is a, a frame from one of those lucky um, dash cam videos. Um, this is actually the view from the direction of Kazakhstan. This is one of the main lorry truck routes from Kazakhstan uh, to Chelyabinsk. It's in a place called uh, uh, Kichigano. Um, and and the, there was a car driving along and it flew overhead and it exploded and a little spark came out the bottom. Um, the spark continued down, down range and the question is, um, could you figure out from photographs like this, if you had several of them, where that uh, spark went? Um, with high enough resolution and with calibrated videos, you could. So one of the things I did was um, a, a little over a week afterwards, I, I found this spot and I took a, a photograph of the sky. Um, we're all, am I already out of time? I think I'm only up to, I think that's his yellow light. <laughs> he was early. Um, so I took a photograph of this uh, a spot, and it may be hard to make out, but you can actually see the stars there, and you can use the stars to triangulate into the points, uh, into the direction that this object flew across the sky, and if you can do that from multiple, multiple directions, you can determine exactly where that spark was and what direction it was going. And uh, one of the speakers tomorrow, Yuri Borovichka, and that, is that you? Yeah. <laughs> I, w I hadn't seen you for a while. I wasn't sure I recognized you. So he'll be speaking about this tomorrow. And he published a paper, was the lead author in a paper in Nature where um, he and his team went out and did a bunch of this video calibration and calculated the tra trajectory of that spark that you saw. and. They, they extrapolated it to a distance of within two kilometers from this hole in the ice, which when I first saw this re press report that there was a hole in the ice, I was a little bit skeptical. Um, but that gave me very high confidence that a meteorite would be recovered from beneath that hole. And in fact, it finally was a couple of months ago. 
in October. So the question is, could we have done that uh, faster and better if we knew it was coming in advance and put out a, uh, an array of very high quality research um, quality instruments? So that's my first point. Um, the second point is uh, uh, showing um, this 3D rendering of uh, a simulation and I um, unlike, so I, I've been doing this airburst modeling for a number of years and I've never really known how to initialize the simulation, how much energy to put in uh, precisely and knowing, um, having all these videos allowed Peter Brown, another author, lead author of a paper in Nature um, last month, they got a light curve from which they could get an energy deposition in the atmosphere as a function of distance and I could use to, that to initialize my simulation and this for, is the first time, I just got to see this for the first time last week. This was done by Brad Carvey and if you look at it very carefully you can see it's puffing up and rising like a cumulus cloud but it's also rotating. It looks like, like it's corkscrewing a little bit um, and, but it's also rising due to buoyancy and um, looking at simulations like this explain, for example, why there were two distinct trails. So if you look along the axis, this is along the long axis of that thing, you can see that it breaks apart into these rotating vortices, very hot vortices, and the white stuff is vaporized asteroid. And so that condenses and forms these clouds and, and explains the outward rotation. And finally, I want to uh, I want to repeat what my uh, what Peter Brown said when he was interviewed on uh, NPR um, after this. He said it was you know think of this as being Christmas in meteor astronomy land. I mean it was such a wealth of data, but if you um, look at the ground and find these things and dig them out of the snow, you know they they look like little lumps of coal you know to the untrained eye. You might think you were a, a bad little girl or boy if you had these delivered to you. But if you cut them open, you see just strikingly beautiful features. And this is not only beautiful, but there's some um, really spectacular science to be had from this, as, as David Kring will describe. And so I'm just going to quickly go through some of these. These were just, uh, um, these photographs were just taken over the weekend by John Lewis, a graduate student at University of New Mexico. Thank you. <laughs> and next is David Kring. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, for those of you who haven't seen them, I have two handouts in the back of the room. Uh, one of them basically captures the slides I'm going to show you in a few minutes. The other one, because the time addresses an issue, um, that inevitably comes up. Uh, how does this event compare to the event that produced Meteor Crater in, in northern Arizona, the world's best preserved small impact site? Um, so if you're interested in that comparison, uh, pick up that handout as well. And for those of you who do, are interested in taking um, a look at this material, uh, I have a sample like Mark's that is actually broken so you can see the interior of this uh, object. Okay, so let me get out of Mark's charts and pull up my own. Okay, this was a different than my machine. Um, let's try view then. Okay. Um, first, I want to point out that uh, I'm up here speaking, but I represent a team. I have uh, three other authors uh, on the screen uh, there, but when the t this full paper comes out, there will be students and several other groups also amongst the author list. Uh, and these uh, email addresses are on that handout in the back of the room, so you can, should feel free to contact uh, any of us. What I would like to do is um, summarize our studies of the meteorite. And uh, we've put together uh, an evolutionary sequence of this object, starting with um, events uh, associated with the formation of our solar system 4.56 uh, billion years ago. Uh, this meteorite is filled with chondrules, which were once molten droplets of magmatic rock that existed uh, in space uh, where the planets um, are today. And all of these objects in the meteorite formed within about 4 million years 
of the initiation of what we call the, the solar nebula. Um, those chondrules accreted um, together with some additional dust uh, to form a small planetesimal. Uh, in this case, we refer to it as the LL chondrite parent, uh, parent uh, body. That is the type of meteoritic material that Chelyabinsk uh, represents. Uh, this body would have accreted over a period of about uh, 10 million years. Chelyabinsk represents a thermally metamorphosed portion of that parent body. Uh, the, the technical terminology is that it is a type 5 thermal metamorphic grade, which means that this object was originally buried several kilometers beneath the surface of uh, this parent body, which was on the order of 100 kilometers uh, in scale. Um, there was then a very large impact event on the LL chondrite uh, parent body. Uh, you can then see a small fragment uh, from of the meteorite over here, and there are these, it's cross-cut by these shock-darkened areas. These are places where that parent body was melted uh, by that impact uh, cratering event, <coughs> and our new uh, data indicates that this formed um, 125 million years uh, after the, the solar nebula. Now, we actually have um, 50,000 samples of NEAs, uh, and we have nearly 6,000 samples from this particular parent body, the LL chondrite parent body. And so over a period of years, Tim Swindle and I and others in the meteoritic community have been putting together a collisional evolution of this parent body, and that's represented gr graphically down here. Uh, we know that after the impact event that's recorded in Chelyabinsk impact uh, uh, meteorite, that this parent body was bombarded severely by a large number of impact events. In fact, this is a period of time in solar system history when the asteroids and other inner solar system planetary bodies uh, were being uh, resurfaced by uh, impact cratering uh, processes. Um, then there was a gap, there was a dearth of impact events about over a period of about 10, uh, 2 billion years. And then we have evidence in the Chelyabinsk meteorite that there were one or two impact events uh, more during the last 500 million years. And using argon-argon analyses, we were able to determine that one of those impact events occurred 25 to 30 million years ago. Uh, the meteoroid then encountered a gravitational resonance in the asteroid belt, and that's altered its orbit, and so at that point, it, it moved from being a main belt asteroid to being a near-Earth uh, asteroid. Um, work by some of my colleagues, in fact, here at Berkeley, uh, Kuni Nuchizumi is the lead uh, author, reported this uh, about two months ago determined that the surface of the Chelyabinsk meteoroid was exposed to space 1.2 uh, million years ago, uh, and suggesting that another collisional event or fragmentation event occurred at that time. And then finally, of course, we had one more collisional event on February 15th of 2013. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for questions. Anybody have a question? Rick Lovett, freelance. Um, a question um, uh, about hazards, although this, the science is, uh, or the, this stuff's cool too. Um, if you knew, um, if, if you had, had a fix on one of these things um, in space, how well would you be able to figure out where it was going to hit? Um, not only to set out your array, but to give a meaningful warning. Uh, I, I have this feeling of warning the Earth is going to be hit by something um, would not be I mean, we'd all be afraid of it. Um. Okay, I, I think I can answer that. Um, there's two ways that we would detect an asteroid like this that might hit the Earth. There is a, a, a privately funded space mission called Sentinel that is uh, scheduled for launch in 2018 that would send a spacecraft into an orbit similar to that of the planet Venus, and it would search for asteroids typically somewhat larger than this, but it would find a fair number of the size of Chelyabinsk and give years or decades of, of warning um, that there was a possibility of an Earth, Earth impact. And that possibility would initially be pretty small and, uh, you know, there would be more observations made uh, if, uh, unless it, uh, hit itself behind the sun or something. Um, 
And we'd probably be able to predict where it's going to hit fairly accurately. We certainly know exactly when it's going to hit and, 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 and a, a line that may be long or it may be short across the face of the earth where it's going to hit. Now there's another approach and that is uh, NASA has uh, funded and there is under development a uh, rather inexpensive project involving small telescopes that would survey the sky about once a night, uh, not to very faint magnitude, um, but as something is coming toward the Earth, as it gets close, it gets much, much brighter than it usually is seen, seen from, from the Earth. So even a small telescope would see a small object like Chelyabinsk uh, days in advance, perhaps, of when it would hit. And it, there was an event like this uh, several years ago where uh, a telescope found an asteroid, pre predicted that it was going to hit within 19 hours. It hit in the Sudan 19 hours later, and yet there was time in between when it was discovered and when it hit, when other observatories were able to see the asteroid and measure its spectrum and determine how fast it was spinning and so on. Uh, and so this is the kind of thing that could be done by this so-called ATLAS project uh, being uh, built by the University of Hawaii. Uh, and that would give not warning time to deflect the asteroid, keep it from hitting the Earth, which you could do if you knew about it years or decades uh, in advance, but at least it would give warning so you could evacuate or at a minimum tell people, don't go to the windows when you see a bright flash of light. I, I have one short thing to, to add about this event that Clark mentioned in 2008. It was in October 2008. It was called 2008 TC3. And uh, the folks at Jet Propulsion Laboratory that calculate orbits did calculate that it was going to hit the Earth. And as I recall, they got the time of entry into the atmosphere and the location to within a few seconds and a few kilometers, if, if I remember right. 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 So they got it very precisely because there was enough data. Uh, Harvey Leifert, freelance writer. I, I have two questions, actually. Uh, you say we can, if we know that it's coming, we can determine exactly when and where it's going to hit. But we don't seem to be able to do that with uh, satellites that are in decaying orbits. They, we know exactly where they are, where they're going, and how fast. And they still say, well, we hope it'll be in the ocean. Uh, so I'm wondering, it seems like a major discrepancy. The second question is, uh, if you had not found any fragments, could you have determined the size of that object, and if so, how do you do that? Well, very simply, the, f the first question, uh, a decaying satellite is coming into the atmosphere tangentially, and, you know, it, it, it's a question of how it's going to be, how it's breaking during many revolutions of the Earth, and that's very difficult to model. A, a typical asteroid is going to come in, you know, pretty much hit where it's going to hit, and that would be my Yes, you, you could amplify and you can take the second part of his question. Okay, yeah, I think, I mean, a, a collision that's coming from an object that's, that's coming from a distance, you know, it's, it's more like billiard balls, you know, <laughs> with very predictable um, trajectories, where, as Clark said, you know, the satellites re-entering, it's almost a chaotic problem because they're, the satellite usually has a very unusual shape. It's got solar panels and things, and we don't know, it depends on atmospheric drag and all sorts of non-gravitational uh, complications so that's why so it's really fundamentally different and uh, the second question I think you asked um, how could we have calculated how big it was and how without, did you in the actual and, I'm sorry not, not only how could you have if you had not found any fragments but how did you do it oh yeah. and this was really done this is really a, a question for Alexander because it was from the infrasound primarily that was one of the methods it is some uh, paper from our colleagues from Alexei Lepichon and others who did estimation of uh, uh, Chelyabinsk event. Uh, actually, I, I think we cannot estimate the size, geometrical size of the stone or iron uh, body, but we can uh, calculate um, power because we have some knowledge about uh, some, uh, some uh, formula which connect um, power of nuclear bombs and uh, infrasound signals and seismic signals also. It's not very, very accurate uh, formulas. But 
anyway we can do estimation of the birth size using infrasound amplitudes and seismic amplitudes yeah. and, and maybe let me amplify on that once you know the the energy of the impact event that's essentially one half mv squared kinetic energy and the velocity was very well known and so that leaves mass then if you make some assumptions about density and we have some sense of what the density of asteroids should be, we observe them in space and we have meteorite examples of them, uh, then you can get an estimate of the diameter. In fact, that was done in the case of Chelya Mints before the stones were actually found. A uh, quick question, Joel Achenbach with the Washington Post and I'll throw it open to whoever wants to answer it. Is there any emerging consensus that there are more of these Chelyabinsk size impacts than had been previously thought possible. In other words, that, that the, the estimate of the likelihood of this may have been a little bit low for, uh, until February 15th. And, and secondly, and maybe Dr. Chapman will address this, should NASA be spending, NASA and Congress and OMB and OSTP and so on, when they put together the budget, should they be investing more money in, in detection of these um, objects and potential um, ways to, to divert them eventually someday or, or, or be, be ready for, for an impact like that. You, couldn't, you wouldn't divert a small one, but can you address that? Um, well, I gave my opinion that I, I think maybe they're, they're more common, to, uh, more frequently impacting, but m maybe, uh, Mark, you want to Yeah, well, I guess, that? I mean, the way you, uh, you, the way you posed that was, is there an emerging consensus? And we're, we're very much arguing amongst ourselves on that. Um, several of us who co-authored the paper with Peter Brown, um, one of our conclusions was that we have underestimated the flux of objects of this size. I mean, the error bars, you know, the uncertainty was already really big on that, and it's still, pretty much within those uncertainty bars, but we're thinking it's at the upper end based on exactly what Clark said. We're, we're seeing these more often than we really should. Um, if, if Tunguska is really a once in 2,000 year event, why did we see it just a little over 100 years ago? I mean, if that happened once, it might seem like a fluke, but it's really happened more than once. So, so explain to me the discrepancy, what you, know, what you had an estimate of the frequency of a Chelyabinsk yeah. or the frequency of um, a Tunguska, but it looks like they're happening more often. Right. So what, what, what well, caused that discrepancy? There's different sources of data, and so the primary source of data for estimating the frequency is from astronomical observations. How many of these have been discovered in space with telescopes? But there are some assumptions built into those estimates, like, you know, what is the albedo? How, how much light do they reflect? You know, if, if, they're, if the albedo, if the mean albedo is slightly different than the assumptions, well, then the mean size is also slightly different. So, you know, it may be that those, you know, those assumptions weren't exactly correct. And let me add, uh, you had a second question. The policy issue. Right. And uh, I'll give you my take on it. Um, Things that natural, natural processes, natural disasters, earthquakes, hurricanes, you know, those kinds of things uh, happen at least a hundred times more frequently than an asteroid impact uh, that would do the same amount of damage. So, uh, and it may be hundreds of times more frequently. So we're talking about uh, a, a kind of disaster that uh, typically is going to be very rare compared to the others. As we know, this is the first one ever, first asteroid disaster in the history of mankind. Now, you might say, therefore, it's not worth doing anything about it. And it's probably not worth doing anything about it at some super expensive scale. But just because some disease is very rare, if it's real and, and it's understood and people are concerned about it, uh, we don't just ignore rare diseases, we, we, we try to do something about it. And in this case, it turns out that building this ATLAS system that I, I mentioned of small telescopes, it's a, it's a several million dollars a, a year at, at most, it's, it's not like a space mission, and uh, that's inexpensive. And also, in this case, unlike many other things that affect human beings, if we find an asteroid that's on, on the way 
to hit us, we really can do something about it. We can predict very accurately when and where it'll hit. We can send up a spacecraft to move it with high confidence. Uh, nothing's ever perfectly confident in this business, but with high confidence we could move it or, or blow it up. And we could certainly uh, evacuate people with, uh, you know, as provided we had a few days weak warning. And so it's something that can be addressed, even if it's not the, the, the major, uh, major disasters uh, like uh, hurricanes and so on. Uh, maybe, Joel, if I could take a stab at that, too. Uh, one of the uncertainties um, that we have, even for events that are nominally historical like Tunguska, is the energy and the object involved is, has been unknown or uncertain. And as, as Mark knows <laughs> firsthand, there's a great debate as, for example, the, uh, the energy associated with Tunguska. And so when you try to draw curves, and I've published a curve back in 2007 that relates impact events of different energies uh, against um, the blast area of damage, the shape of that curve or, or the relationship is very uncertain if you don't have existing data. And so for the very first time, this is to me the very important thing about Chelly events, for the very first time, we know what the object was, we know exactly what the energy was, and we know exactly what the blast area damage was. So we have now a data point. Whereas before we had data points with humongous error bars. Um, now, the, a way to better refine that, of course, is to have more events like this. We don't really wish that upon <laughs> ourselves. Um, but I would say then there are, there are um, three paths forward. And, and um, I think we're now in a position to address all three paths forward because now these types of events are no longer hypothetical. That was the other important thing about Shelly events. You know, we've been up here talking about these types of things for years, but now the entire world understands that they can be real. So what are those three uh, paths forward? One, you can study uh, the geologic record for past events, try to evaluate what past impact cratering uh, uh, processes have done on the Earth. Uh, two, we need to enhance the surveys, which is something that we've already uh, discussed. Uh, and three, we need to invest in uh, devising mitigation scenarios. And uh, I think if you do all three of those things simultaneously, we will be in a better position to predict uh, these future hazards and react to them uh, when they uh, appear. Hi, um, we have a question from someone on the chat, uh, Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. Uh, what type of atmospheric monitoring is currently available that provides information on the frequency of asteroid or meteoroid hits to Earth, and what does that tell us about the frequency? Atmospheric monitoring. That's the question. Well, uh, I, I'm not quite sure what's meant by atmospheric monitoring, but observations from the surface of the Earth of meteors and bolides and so on, uh, there are are people who specialize in, in that. There's amateur astronomers, in fact, that, that, that uh, study meteors, but there's a whole field of uh, meteor astronomy where people are, have cameras that are measuring these things and uh, other people studying what, uh, well, the spectra of these flashes and uh, people are trying to analyze these, these in terms of the frequency and sizes and, and when they hit the Earth and whether they're from comets or, or, or asteroids. And uh, it's a field of meteor astronomy and I don't know, there's several hundred practitioners around the world. I, I would add that there is also a global monitoring, monitoring system of infrasound de uh, detectors. And in fact, that's another uh, set of data that complement the astronomical observations. So there are atmospheric explosions. Um, these are bolides, super bolides, uh, large events that generate these infrasound waves. And over the decades, we've built up a, a statistical count of those, and that helps define the curve. And of course, Alexander is, is an expert on that. Uh, and this uh, system, it was not uh, um, previously constructed to, to monitor uh, such events. It was uh, dedicated to uh, monitoring of nuclear tests. But uh, we have, uh, say, 40 stations operating all over the world who records infrasound 24 hours a day. And uh, all this data, we can use it to monitor, uh, to check uh, bolides, 
to, to get a lot of information about it. And also we have some uh, stations which are not part of IMS, International Monitoring System. Uh, for example, in Kazakhstan we have additional Kazakh infrasound array which also may be used to, to, to study uh, bolides, to study meteoroids. Okay, we, um, we used a backup system to get to some people who are um, participating remotely. Is there anyone with a question from, from the telephone? Is there anyone on the telephone? <laughs> okay, maybe that's not working. Any other questions from here in the room? I have one more. I want to come back to the um, uh, to the melts or to the, the, the uh, to the substances. I'm gathering that you're dating these impacts off the spider webbing of cracks um, um, and basically uh, like you date lavas um, um, from the melts. Is that what you're doing to get all these? And I'm, I'm getting the sense that that these are not very solid rocks because they must not be very big if you can see cracks in them. Yeah, the, the, the Chelyabinsk meteoroid um, comes from the LL chondrite parent body, which itself has been repeatedly battered. Um, and so the material, even before it hit the Earth's atmosphere, had been structurally weakened by these past collisional events. In fact, we had proposed, based on studies oh, a decade, maybe two decades ago, from other meteorite showers that these types of collisional events did lead to the structural, uh, decrease in the structural integrity of these types of objects. And in fact, um, Mark may remember, he, told, he sent me an email saying he was going to go to Russia to, to pick up specimens of this, and I, I, I asked him three questions. Tell me if it's going to be an ordinary chondrite, which I suspected. I said, tell me if it's a breccia, which I suspected, and tell me if it's cross-cut by impact melt veins, which I suspected, based on this previous work. So, um, so yes, uh, the, the rock had been uh, severely damaged by past impact events on its parent body, and that led to uh, structurally uh, weakening the object before it, before it actually hit the Earth. Now, what is it we're dating? Um, we're dating um, radiometric uh, systems that have been reset uh, at different times uh, in uh, the, the rock's history. Uh, we used uh, two uh, different te techniques. We used uranium lead to determine the age of phosphates in the object, and those phosphates had been uh, degassed and the radiometric clocks reset at 4.442 billion years ago. Uh, the younger uh, impact age that I gave you, this, this 25 to 30 million year old age, that was based on um, the degassing and resetting of the argon-argon radiometric system. Um, and uh, so we use different techniques uh, to catch events at different times. Uh, Harvey Leifert again, one more question. Uh, the mothership or the parent rock, as it's called up there, of these fragments, does it still exist or was it destroyed a long time ago? If it exists, where is it? it it's in fragments. Um, where all of those fragments are in space is still uncertain. Um, some of my astronomical colleagues have said they think they know where it is, but I, I would say that that's, <coughs> excuse me, still uh, up to great uh, debate. Um, some of them we do know where they are. Um, the Japanese, the JAXA Space, JAXA space Agency, uh, sent a spacecraft to one of these LL chondrite fragments. It's called the asteroid Itakawa. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a 540 meter long example of this object, uh, 20 meter, there's, it's covered with 20 meter sized boulders comparable in size to the Chelyabinsk meteoroid. Um, and what's frightful, and I'll actually show a slide like this uh, in tomorrow's uh, presentation, is the size of the L chondrite parent body compared to Itakawa, compared to Chelyabinsk, which you can't even see at the same scale. So you suddenly realize when you see this graphic that there are a lot of Chelyabinsk meteoroids out there in space, and some of those are going to hit Earth in the future. Okay, time for one more brief question. Anybody? Okay, that's it then. Thank you very, very much for your presentations, and thanks everyone for participating. Um, our next press conference will be at 2.30, and that's on taking Landsat to the extreme.